Well, welcome everybody to another of HydroTerra's webinars. Today, we're joined by Jack Un, who's Emeritus Professor from the University of Queensland. I will introduce him in more detail shortly. The topic is exploring and understanding the toxicity of inorganic and organic contaminants with a special reference to the new IARC classifications of PFOS and PFO. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Bunwarung people of the Kulin Nation where we are located today and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. There's a picture of our presenter and uh, a bit about our presenter. He's had a very impressive career in environmental toxicology. So I've been having a chat to Jack and I've got a few extra notes on him. Uh, he came to Australia in 1970, originally born in Southern China um, and grew up in Macau, which is uh, a Portuguese colony. And that just then, um, his father was a chef and had a, a big uh, range of restaurants, uh, both overseas and in Australia. Um, and his father's dying wish was that Jack should not pursue a career as a chef. Uh, so Jack followed his father's instruction and uh, proceeded to move to Australia and study initially at uh, QUT and then subsequently at the University of Queensland, where he obtained his PhD. He did most of his studies while working part-time, which is impressive in itself. And uh, he now uh, has achieved his PhD in environmental toxicology and chemistry from the University of Queensland. He is an internationally recognised certified toxicologist the diplomat of American Board of Toxicology. He's one of only a handful of people in Australia who have that. I think there's maybe three in the country. His major research themes include mixture toxic toxicity of both organic and inorganic pollutants, chemical speciation in environmental and biological media, bioavailability in relation to toxicities and risk assessment, carcinogenicity and mechanistic studies using various in vitro and in vivo models. He was the first in the world to establish a mouse model demonstrating that inorganic arsenic in drinking water induced multiple tumours. And this is a big thing and a really important thing in Jack's career. It's a really big problem around the world, arsenic in drinking water in places such as Bangladesh, for example. So that was a big deal. At the international level, Professor Un expertise has been recognized by the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and the World Health Organization FAO Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives, as demonstrated by his contribution to several monographs and technical reports produced by these agencies, including the upcoming monograph on PFO and PFOS. At the national level, Jack served as a member of the National Health and Medical Research Council Health Investigation Levels Working Committee, which oversaw the setting of the current national environmental protection measures. Professor Un has a career list of over 500 scientific and technical publications of which about 50% are peer-reviewed articles. So a truly impressive career. Uh, so Jack is one of those people who really determine whether or not these contaminants that we're dealing with and cleaning up are necessary to be cleaned up. So really very, very important part of the contaminated land industry. Before we get started, 
We love your questions and we've got over 370 registrants today. So that's a great tribute to you, Jack, to have such a big audience. To log your questions, please use the Q&A at the top of your screen and I will read those questions out to Jack at the end for him to answer. Why does Hydroterra do these? We love to share knowledge and obviously Jack's got a wealth of knowledge over a very long career. We like to help to facilitate that and we like to take an industry leadership position. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jack to discuss his topic of exploring and understanding the toxicity of inorganic and organic contaminants with a special reference to new IARC classifications of PFOS and PFO. Over to you, Jack. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's an honor to be invited uh, to play a part in your seminar series, and thank you for your kind invitation. Um, let's start by toxicology is a very complex um, um, topic, but uh, I like to simplify things a little bit. Really, it's about toxicity. Um, uh, the, the grandfather of toxicology, Paracelsus, had a really famous quote. The dose makes the poison. And and that's uh that was centuries ago that he uh he said that, a very wise man. But today I would like to say precisely it's the internal dose that matters. And I, I will use some of the, the concept why that's is important uh in the next few slides. Next. In Australia, we use this uh, framework on the left-hand side. Um, and um, WHO and ESC, uh, US EPA, uh, they got a similar framework. Uh, the number of steps is no different. Uh, the terminology might be a little bit different, but in essence, they, they're pretty well identical. Uh, with a lot of risk assessment done in Australia, uh, most probably, most account, um, consultant will be focusing on the exposure measurement. Uh, meaning, if you go to a contaminated site, you want to know uh, the contamination uh, at that site. And you probably take a, a water sample or take a soil sample, uh, whatever appropriate, send it away or do it yourself and measure the contaminant concentration in that sample. Uh, now that's that's well and good, uh, but it's, it doesn't really measure uh, what is the internal dose when someone exposed to it. So over the last two decades, and myself and, and other colleagues in, in Australia, uh, working towards to filling the gap, you know the concentration, how do we estimate the internal dose. So we introduced the concept of bioavailability and bioaccessibility as a uh, uh, default test for, as a surrogate test for bioavailability. So by knowing a site-specific bioavailability of a contaminant, one would afford the, uh, a better refined estimate of the internal dose. And that's, that's what I said before. After all, it's the internal dose that matters. Next, please. So back in the um, more than a decade ago now, um, Cory and I, and namely uh, Albert Uhas, uh, Ewan and, uh, and uh, Ravi, um, CRCK, uh, in agreement with uh, National Environmental Protection Council and prepare this document um, for the Lampen review at the time. So my colleague and I uh, composed our experience and, and our own data and that of overseas data to write this uh, technical report 
And part of the technical report is a part two, is a industry guidance. And how do we use uh, the concept of bioavailability uh, to better estimate uh, the internal dose? Next. So as a, a matter of uh, demonstration or, or application of that concept, uh, some years ago, um, we have a PhD student and we got some money from ARC, Australian Research Council, uh, to do some research. Part of the research is uh, utilizing bioavailability and look at the food web, food web transfer and how we can apply this concept uh, for a more sustainable uh, rehabilitated mine size. So the um, diagram showing uh, the, on the top right-hand corner is contaminated mine site or any, any site for that matter. If it happened with pasture on there, and then the EIL, environmental investigation level, uh, has some input into how much so, uh, soil contaminant you, you should or shouldn't have. Uh, and then from the pasture that uh, in Australia, um, if you look at the Mansai map and the cattle grazing uh, map in Australia, there's a lot of overlapping uh, in uh, area. So, so cattle grazing is important uh, industry in, in Australia, particularly in, in the last decade or so, and the beef price has gone, gone through the roof. And then uh, if you graze uh, animal adjacent to Mansai or on the Mansai indeed, then you would worry about what potentially available for uptake into the animal and subsequently through the food chain and the human consumption uh, of that uh, uh, muscle or offals come from the cattle. Now, every step has got some guideline, uh, guidance value, the EIL, um, the uptake is uh, we demonstrate that uh, we, we want to uh, refine that estimate by by using the concept of bioavailability. Uh, the meat uh, produce will have the uh, maximum permissible concentration for human consumption or in the old day, we call it the uh, uh, maximum residue level. And with the soil, and it's got the health investigation level uh, to human. So to explore that pathway, uh, we did a series of experiments uh, to utilize the knowledge of bioavailability and how we apply in a field situation. Uh, next. So as an example, um, we we got a number of mining material. Uh, they contaminated with uh, arsenic, lead, uh, cadmium, and zinc, just to name a few. Uh, so we do a mapping of uh, the sites, uh, grid testing to map the contaminant level across the site. Um, by the way, um, uh, this has been uh, revegetated. As you can see, the grass is very tall, as tall as uh, uh, us on the uh, top left-hand uh, corner there. So we got, we conducted both control experiment, meaning we do it uh, in our own farm and under laboratory condition. And also we did uh, put cattle on the site, on a contaminated site, and they do the field validation. Our target were uh, arsenic, lead, cadmium, and zinc, although we measure other elements, nickel, cobalt, uh, copper, and so on. But these are the uh, two main target, uh, four main targets. Next. Jack, how does the cow react? To oh, sorry. Um, I should mention that too. Um, the cow reacts all right. They're in a confined environment when we... Uh, uh, do the sample at uh, specified intervals. Uh, as you can see there, at the top left-hand corner, we we suck a piece of liver out. It's called a liver biopsy. Cows are very tough. Uh, a bit of local anesthetic. Uh, they, they didn't feel a thing, actually. 
And then the top right hand corner is the muscle biopsy. And then we also take blood. Uh, so uh, we're monitoring, monitoring the, the intake as well as the uh, target organ uh, and blood uh, for uptake studies. Next. So here, that's, oh, we got lots of uh, graph, but uh, I only used a couple to, to make the point. Uh, this particular graph is generated uh, by dosing um, um, tiling material from Kiston Gold Mine, uh, some historical soil sample from uh, Gimpy Gold, and of course we got our, um, our control, positive control and negative control. So this diagram here, uh, demonstrated the uptake. By comparing the uptake, in this case, in the liver, uh, the MPC is one ppm or, or one milligram per kilogram uh, in, the, in the liver. And that's, that was the uh, Australian uh, MPC. Uh, different country might have a slightly different uh, MPC uh, for arsenic. So the top two graph, the red and the... Uh, purple, uh, is the positive control. So if we take the average at the end of the experiment as uh, what is the uptake by a pure chemical, and then you take the uptake, let's say, for example, the uh, Gimpy Gold historical um, uh, tiling sample, you can work out the relative uptake. So the relative bioavailability compared to a standard. And obviously the, the Kisten one got a much lower uh, control. So this is the important information enable us to develop predictive tools. In this case, it's, it's a, a validation of the uptake using a real tiling material. Uh, next. So here's another example for lead, uh, for instance. Uh, so, the top line is the uh, lead acetate, um, and the, um, the 0.5 milligram per kilogram is the uh, first standard Australia and New Zealand uh, for maximum residue uh, level, or ML, they call it maximum level, or it could be MRL, maximum residue level. Uh, the uptake, again, against time. So from then we generate a bioavailability result for that material uh, in um, in cattle. So we again we utilize that uh, for our um, uh, following uh, work. Uh, <clears throat> the red line there is um, come from uh, material come from century zinc. Uh, next, please. So with the maximum permissible level in, in mind, I use arsenic as an example, then we can have uh, some kind of a correlation, a linear regression, and, and how uh, uptake versus time um, develop. So based on this particular material, you can see uh, around about 200, 220 odd days, you will reach uh, a one uh, ppm in the liver. When you do a 95% uh, confidence level, then it's a little bit, bit more conservative, conservative. For that material, you're talking about 100, 130 days. In other words, that cattle can graze on that side for up to 130 days or thereabouts without any adverse health effect to the cattle or the subsequent meat or liver will meet the Australian standard. Okay, next. Similarly, you can do um, predictive uh, uh, monitoring on that particular sample for lead instance. Uh, a and S, so A is the uh, uh, maximum you can allow have S is more conservative. So for lead, around about 160 days uh, is safe uh, for, for both the animal and the human consumption.
Next. Without going into too much detail, we can utilize the bioavailability data for that material to calculate how many days that you can graze um, the cattle on a contaminated site. So we set the number at 480, as when we did the back calculation, 480 milligram per kilogram is, is safe. Uh, so if you got a site less than that, then you pretty much can graze the animal uh, for as long as you like. Uh, usually people kill the animal um, in a short time. In any case, in a few years, uh, 12 months, two years, uh, they, they will go to the slaughterhouse. But by the way, this is, is no, no harm effect. Obviously, uh, if a big operation, you need to monitor it. Uh, uh, look at, make sure the, um, the soil and pasture concentration uh, remain the same uh, over the years. Uh, over the period that you uh, wish to uh, graze the animal on that site. Now, if it's higher than that, uh, then you need to ask, do you know the bioavailability of that uh, arsenic on that site? If you don't, you better do it. And that's in, in according to the, um, the, um, the guidance document uh, before, you don't have to do animal testing to do it. Uh, you can get away with uh, surrogate test, extraction test. There's some guidance and methodology there. I won't go go through the detail. You can perhaps shortcut doing that. Obviously, the target animal is the preferred uh, way to do it. And then you can work out the average uh, daily dose uh, from that. You know the soil ingestion. Um, uh, for the Australian environment, we from our field tests and our our uh, laboratory tests, we think the animal will eat about three hundred grams of soil a day. And the pasture, we calculated it. And uh, by the way, the pasture is uh, almost uh, insignificant in the whole scheme of things. You're talking a fraction of ppm in the pasture, and you're talking about hundreds of ppm in the soil and from that you can calculate the safe grazing period so this is just um, a short summary of it and the red zone in the high risk if you got certain uptake and the certain concentration is a high risky area and you aim uh, to graze the cattle in the green area if you do the moderate risk area and then you can only graze the animal for a very short time. Um, depending on the pasture quality, soil, uh, contamination uh, scenario, you can develop some sort of manage management plan to utilize a uh, contaminated site and turn it into a valuable resource. Okay, next. Just before we move on, Jack, I mean, yep. Under management there, you've got ensure limited plant arsenic lead uptake. Yes. But it seems to me like that's sort of a bit of a catch-all phrase, like aren't we determining that let's plant grass in this area and let things graze on it, so we're... Yeah, we, we do. Uh, in fact, you, you do that as a first step anyway. Uh Otherwise, you wouldn't know the site is um, contaminated. Yeah. Yeah, the fact that it's contaminated, uh, as I said before, over the years may change. So it's a good idea to have some sort of management plan to, to retest the soil and retest the plant as you graze. Um, but if you have a very small operation, um, then the financial resource may not allow you to do uh, elaborate management plan. You know, as you saw, saw uh, how much you, you are prepared to to put on. Um, so you can go more conservative, assuming everything moderate uh, uh, harm, then you can manage, uh, manage them that, that way uh, to have a short grazing period. Typically, 
a mine site uh, is very small compared to a, a cattle country. We're talking about hundreds of acres compared to a, a maybe 10, 20 acres, right? So the pasture, in any case, is limited. But the fact that you got that, you might as well use that uh, resource and make that into a, a valuable asset. In fact, in effect, the, um, the site we study, it really well pasture. And, and the guy next door can, in fact, uh, graze cattle there for a long time, from, from a few months old to, to the time they, uh, they take it to slaughter. So, so it's a, a valuable a resource because the density of the pasture is dense, and much more denser than your hundreds of acres. You know what I mean? So intense grazing on a limited area uh, is a valuable asset. Okay. okay, next. So the example two, um, the bioavailability is somewhat involved, but I like to look at and how we can um, manage the sauna in gold tiling stem better and, and developing um, a more practical essay uh, to predict risk. At the moment, no, uh, back at the moment in Australia uh, for for water testing or, or sediment testing, mycotox. Uh, there's commercial laboratory provide their service in Australia to consultants to mining companies. We like to think the new greener. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, is a more suitable uh, model, uh, particularly for uh, gold tiling stem. Um, with any gold mining operation, the tiling stem water is always the concern to migratory birds or to the birds uh, more generally uh, speaking. They come, come to the site, they drink our hell, after thousands of miles of um, migrating from other country and and uh, that have been bird deaths um, uh, in in um, the last decades and they're probably still happening uh, right now. So the guideline value in Australia is 50 milligram uh, per litre uh, back in the 2006. Um, Nicholas uh, identified that some years later, the the uh, guidelines are established purely on few observations. You know, if dams is containing fifty milligram uh, per liter or less, they don't seem to have um, uh, mortality or bird problem. Uh, but that's not to say the bird didn't fly away and then die. Uh, then how do you know? Um, so it's also a reference uh, by uh, my colleague uh, Barry Nolder et al. back in 2008. Uh, he's a senior author for Sinai Manage Management uh, Planning for Australia. So those three uh, references are probably a, a useful reference to look at if you're interested in Sinai in, in water. Uh, so at the moment, if you think you've got high Sinai level or you as part of management uh, plan on-site, on -site, you take the sample to a lab uh, that's certified to do that um, uh, measurement. Uh, for cyanide and what cyanide, the uh, we, we acid uh, dissociated cyanide. Uh, and you might wait for days or, or, or weeks for the result to come back, and meanwhile, you might have bird deaths. Uh, so we developed an essay that you can turn turn around the result if you push, you can turn around the result in 24 hours. You get uh, not, not only the uh, now, whether it's a toxicity and you actually can demonstrate whether it's safe or not. So next, please. Next. Coming. So I want to introduce a Eugrena. It's a unique organism. It's not, not a, a plant or animal. It's in its own category. Uh, you carry it cells. And in fact, they behave like animal and plants. 
Um, the unique feature about that, they can survive. Actually, they prefer to grow on acid environment, pH around about 3.5. They can survive in pH 2 to about 4 point something 5. They can survive in neutral pH, but they, they, they prefer a lower pH. pH 3.5 is happened to be the gastric pH, la you and me, and indeed uh, for the birds. Uh, we use the chicken in this conceptual model as a model. It's not so easy to uh, get wild birds and um, there's the strict animal ethics for that. Uh, so the good old chicken is a good model as a surrogate for, uh, for uh, wildlife. So, what we do would put that in the loop. Uh, look at the cytotoxicity of uh, uh, WAD, a what cyanide, meaning sodium cyanide, copper cyanide complex, and the zinc cyanide complexes. Uh, to look at a uh, dose response of uh, water containing uh, cyanide as specific concentration, we make it up in the lab, or uh, tiling sample from a tiling stem. Uh, then you get a calibration uh, curve, um, like a response curve in the uh, Ugarina curve coming down. Um, so the higher the dose, uh, the more Ugarina will be killed. And we calibrate that against the chicken model. So here we dose the ch chicken using, again, the same solution. Uh, to look at the toxicity, uh, see what concentration is toxic uh, to uh, to the birds. We don't necessarily need to use a high concentration to kill 50% of the birds or the chicken. Uh, we know the concentration uh, where the bird will be suffered too much or is going to die. So the ethics allow you to do up to a certain uh, toxicity. So from that toxicology investigation using chicken, we can work out the so-called NOAEL, the no effect, uh, the no adversable observable effect level. Uh, next, Chris. Jack, just before we move on. Yeah. So choosing the poor old chicken yep. seems to be have been decided because we're regularly eating chickens. Um, no, not that. No, no, in terms of the ethics side of things. So yeah. we're not eating wildlife, so we've we've chosen something that we, we produce. This is not health uh, human health risk assessment. This is for wildlife. Yeah. yeah. So the choice of using a chicken, though, as yeah. distinct from using some other animal is based on the fact that we what, have a lot of chickens and produce them. Is that, but rather than- It's a, um, a hard to trap wildlife. A chicken yeah. is also uh, more controlled in terms of age, sex. Uh, so it's an under control environment. And they got similar GI track as, um, as uh, the birds, the upper uh, GI track pH is similar. So we've got all the physiological composition uh, similar to birds. And we we also know the um, acute toxicity in chicken. Or for that matter, we know it for many other, uh, other animal, uh, wild birds. So using chicken as a standard, you can upscale the toxicity or downscale the toxicity when you extrapolate the result to other birds. Okay. okay. Uh, I will come to come back to that in a minute. Next. A bit like drug development, uh, you use a dog and and um, and rats and mice and rabbits for your initial uh, toxicology um, um, testing and until you get to the clinical trial. You know what I mean? So chicken is uh, animals been using been used in uh, medical research. And now toxicology research for many years, decades. All right, uh, back to your greener. So we established the uh, IC50. Uh, obviously, I only show that 
um, that we saw here, we can have RC10, RC20. Once you got a dose response curve, you can uh, work out any value you want. Uh, there's some subtle difference between the uh, uh, Z and SMZ. Z is uh, the organism behave like uh, uh, a plant and SMZ behave like animal. Some, there's some subtle differences between uh, the two species, but nevertheless, uh, when you're talking about um, uh, the, uh, the cyanide, for instance, the sodium cyanide, for instance, uh, they're very similar. So when when the uh, cyanide conflict is dissociated, it, it's going to be all cyanide anyway. In any case, as you can see, zinc cyanide uh, toxicity uh, in the in the same range of uh, sodium cyanide. Uh, the the difference in toxicity in the organism is to do with its dissociation, and how is that become available? The the undissolved uh, cyanide is less by 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 available to dissociate sodium cyanide. So there again, it's uh, partially related to bioavailability uh, in terms of toxicity. Uh, next, sorry, just to, with the bioavailability, does that uh, is that also a bit species specific? So is it there... is, it is, it is. But once you've got the toxicity calibration, you can um, grab, uh, extrapolate to other species. Uh, I'll show that in a minute. Okay. So with, with that, it's similarly in the uh, chicken. So the, uh, the sodium cyanide is more toxic to zinc cyanide and then it's more toxic than copper cyanide. That's to do with how how they become uh, uh, bioavailable. Different compounds uh, have different bioavailability, okay? So now we can establish the relationship between your greener uh, grassless and uh, chicken toxicity. Uh, depends on whether you're interested in, um, in um, using the plant model or the animal model. Uh, so that that's just a, a correlation between the two and the uh, uh, feeding curve. From there, next slide. So from the curve, you can read from the uh, read from the uh, Ugrina model and and read across to the the, the chicken model. Uh, so what is toxic in Ugrina? Uh, and then it may or may not be toxic uh, in the in the bird. But once we've got a toxicity uh, level for the bird, and we can calculate a lot of things, okay? Uh, for the Ugrina, for, for, for that matter. The concept of NOAEL and LOAEL has been used in toxicology, uh, those response for youngs. And people spend a lot of time and money to, to establish uh, uh, a dose response curve concentration versus the toxicity endpoint and to establish a NOAEL. Uh, so NOAEL sometimes is extrapolated, uh, you know, follow the curve, extrapolate into a low dose, no uh, uh, concentration. But you can calculate uh, the equivalent for birds, okay? Since we know the L LC50 or the LD50 for chicken, and we know the LD50, say for ducks, for instance, and if what kills the bird at 100 ppm, let's see the duck is five times more sensitive than the chicken, then 20 ppm will kill the duck. Okay, so we got that kind of table tabulated, uh, I'm not showing it here, uh, to make the point. So if something le uh, less toxic, uh, less susceptible uh, to cyanide compared to chicken, then they, that species can tolerate more, uh, more um, uh, cyanide in the solution. If it's more sensitive, then it can tolerate less. 
So next slide, please. So okay. after doing all these exercises, it's only a few birds, then we got toxicity data that we can relate it to. There have been many birds that got to toxicity data, not all of them. Uh, but the importantly, the current uh, Australian guideline, uh, 50 milligram per litre, may not be all that safe. Uh, particular if Mallard duck is the most sensitive species. American uh, kestrel and the black voucher. And so these three species we identify a current guideline uh, may not be safe. In fact, we know it's not safe. Mm. Okay, uh, it depends on how often they drink the water and whether they decide to drink the water or not. So if it happened to migratory uh, uh, birds from a long distance and they, mm. they're likely to be hanging around for a long time and drink a lot of uh, water and that guideline value uh, is uh, almost certain it's not safe. Okay, next. So Jack, just before we move on, if, yep. if we determine that something's not safe, what's the process for sort of reviewing the criteria? in Australia is, how does that work? Well, you need to demonstrate, there's been a lot of, a um, uh, few observations, and in fact, a PhD was done uh, by a, a PhD student of uh, Barry Nolo. They're very always had an uh, interest in uh, cyanide. If there's evidence that is this three species of uh, birds that it's um, I visit Mansai frequently, uh, um, uh, namely, namely um, the uh, gold mining Mansai I refer to. And then you've got to have some kind of management strategy. In fact, Mansai try all sorts of things, water bomb, sound, cannonballs, uh, net, uh, to, to uh, deter uh, uh, birds uh, drinking their water. So this is a part of the management uh, plan. Uh, if that um, that kind of uh, prevention strategy don't stop this bird coming and you still see bird deaths mm -hmm. uh, and uh, frequently, and then you need to revisit the guideline. A guideline is guideline for that day. Uh, a guideline gets reviewed every few years. Um, and if there's few evidence to demonstrate that there's an um, acceptable number of bird deaths, then, then you really need to look at the guidelines again. Did you say cannonball? Oh, cannonball, like uh, <laughs> water bomb cannonballs <laughs> and things fire through the air, not real cannon, but, but yeah, just all sorts of strategies been uh, been tried out. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. And then, and then we have uh, a more complex uh, toxicity issue. What about mixtures? There's some guidelines for mixtures, uh, like the dot point three um, additive assumption for uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbon, uh, dioxin-like compound. Just name a couple. But they are, for on one side, you've got mix, mixtures of many metals. i name, you know, arsenic, lead, cadmium, nickel, as zinc as a typical example. Uh, by the way, these, these four or five metals is being uh, more problematic. Um, and then you, you've got mixture of different organic compounds. You know, you've got, what about if you've got benzopyrene and dioxin in the same mix and then plus the PFAS and, and some pesticide in the same mix. How do you deal with that? Um, and then you've got mixture of inorganic and organic uh, compound together, uh, metals and, uh, and PFAS, metals and benzopyrene in, in some sites. Uh, you know, if you, a monster, for instance, uh, not not unusual, you see um, uh, benzopyrene through diesel engine and para, uh, poly para, uh, aromatic para, hydrocarbon on the side, as well as the metal con uh, contamination, uh, firefighting foam, uh, that kind of thing, uh, with uh, mix mixture with uh, metals. 
And through our research and, our, and that of others, um, and the addition approach may or may not uh, be applicable to some of these mixtures. So we have demonstrated in the last 10, maybe the last 20 years that um, this additive effect or synergistic effect or antagonistic effects it's really depending on the number of compounds in the mix and the type of compound in the mix and depending on the concentration of each compound and what biological endpoint you look at, whether it's dead or whether it's um, endocrine disrupting, um, meaning changing hormone, or whether it's some other oxidative stress, for instance, or genotoxic. So it's really complicated. I don't have time today to talk about it and maybe I reserve that for another occasion. Uh, but I uh, point you to a number of uh, our own publication, uh, more recently on mixture of PFAS, which I will talk about later about the classification of P, uh, PFOS and PFO. Uh, so a number of pu uh, publications addressing interaction of PFAS. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have uh, more application or more publication demonstrating uh, mixed organic, inorganic, uh, mixed metals uh, in, in a, a cell line system or uh, in a in which uh, in vivo, the Ugrina model is actually uh, in vivo, is an animal. We treat that as an animal. Uh, so there's um, a number of study, uh, 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 Tokgal 19, and some other studies uh, indirect related to uh, bioavailability and, and interaction, as I said. Um, so there's, there's more study there, so I, I didn't list all of them. Uh, this study is all done by our uh, previous postdoc uh, fellows and uh, PhD students, and now they they research it in their own right. So they uh, they all all doctors now, um, and and uh, many researchers uh, they're leading their own research in their own right. Next, okay, we're talking about carcinogen uh, as one of the endpoints. Uh, I want to lead that into the PFOS and P, uh, PFAS, uh, PFOS and PFO. Back in the 1950, there's a Delaney's cross. If you uh, want to become a toxicology, this is one of the very first lessons you've got to learn. Uh, 1958, uh, Delaney's cross prohibits the use of food additive that has been found to induce cancer or cancers in human or animal, the keywords are all animal, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, both. So in their wisdom, uh, uh, but this has been not wrong before, wrongly classified agents. Um, for example, I use one single example, there are, there are others. Uh, example, 2018 FDA banned a number of artificial flavors, I list them there. You don't see individual ingredient on the label. More often than not, they they said has this this uh, this in uh, this uh, product or produce con con contains artificial flavors. All right, but some of these are carcinogens, and they been banned for you for using in uh, food. Uh, but have they got it wrong before? Yes, they have. And there's reason why and how they got it wrong. Next. So saccharines was found to be a carcinogen and was banned in the late 1970s. And perhaps in some other country, not, uh, early 1980s. But it was banned based on the fraud research and conclusion that they draw from that research. And the reason and, and the ruling was uh, reversed by the year 2000, and some country might be a little bit later, but around about year 2000, um, it's, um, it's been withdrawn as a, a carcinogen additive uh, 
in food. Now, why is it classified as a carcinogen? It causes a bladder cancer. But why is it withdrawn? Because they only observe it in male rats. Why, why is it so unique about male rats? Male rat is the only animal species that we are aware of. The female rats don't have it. The alpha-2 uh, microgobulin. In the bladder, is a, a got a raised pH as well as high sodium. So saccharin forms a precipitate in the bladder. And also rat is unique. They walk around in four feet. And that compound sitting in the bladder for a long time once it precipitated. We are two legs of animal, not four four legs, so we won't have that problem. Even though we uh, we don't have it, but even though we have a alpha two uh, microglobulin, the chance of that remaining in our bladder is lower. Uh, so female rats don't have it; other animals don't have it. So we classify uh, a food additive potentially causing human car uh, carcinogenicity. In a food, they only occur in male. So by understanding the importance of uh, toxicity mechanism, we reverted uh, the decision, what we, we knew about saccharin early on. So in IARC, IARC's job is really to classify carcinogen, and they do their own research as well. So it's... Uh, uh, got top, top scientists working for them in their own right. So, but nevertheless, one of the key functions of IR is to assess compounds for uh, human uh, carcinogenicity. So, toxic mecha uh, mechanism is one of the key features uh, that uh, involve in the evaluation. Next. So what are the key features that I uh, pay so, so much importance on it? Before we go there, we look at uh, the IARC uh, document. More often than not, they follow these um, headings. the actual chapters in the monograph. So they look at exposure, uh, characterization, um, human animal exposure. Uh, they look at half life and that kind of thing. Cancer in human, cancer in experimental animals, mechanistic uh, evidence. That's a big bold part of it. Uh, the the many pages are written on that many references site, and then they summarize the result, and then the work group for this. Uh, monograph, there's 30, 30 of uh, us, myself included, um, to write different chapter, to review uh, other people's chapter, and then we get together for 11 days uh, at the headquarter, bombarding our, our brain cell uh, with questions and answers and, and whatnot. And then the last day, we sit down and to finalize their evaluation. When, once that's finalized, there's no turning back, if you know what I mean. It's out. Okay, uh, next. So we're looking at, I'll use P, P4 as an example. P4 is exactly the same, same uh, uh, table. So with over a thousand uh, pages of written document, uh, over a thousand, I think it's about 60,600 uh, references. Uh, we come down to a few tables for each of, of the chapters. So this is a mechanistic chapter. So we look, we've got a number of questions we need to ask ourselves. We need to support that with exposed human um, data, human primary cell data, experimental system, meaning uh, uh, secondary uh, immortalized cell, not primary cell, uh, other animal cell, 
uh, are, are there biological uh, testing and so on. And to summarize that with the color, whether it's coherent, uh, meaning it's uh, very high levels of confidence about the result, whether the results only suggest, uh, suggestive, uh, whether there's very limited result. And then the case C, uh, key characteristic, gets the evaluation. The darker the color you get, the stronger the evidence, in other words. Okay, next. So for another biological endpoint, I put that out as an example because there's some people interested in, uh, in uh, well, does it affect the hormones, for instance? Uh, so that's being, that has been uh, considered under KCH. Uh, modulated receptor uh, mediated effect. So thyroid hormone, estrogen, progesterone, uh, in that we're look, looking at um, uh, testosterone and so on. And other re receptors that's important um, uh, for translating uh, into uh, toxicity, translating into other uh, endpoint. So I won't go into detail, except this is one of the evaluation uh, that we go through. Again, exposed human, primary cell, and uh, experimental systems. Next. So there's some scribble there about how do you, how would you consider consistency and also coherence of the result, uh, whether the results are limited or, or sufficient. So there's some guidance uh, for the working group uh, to follow. So it needs to be standardized. Otherwise, it's, it's, you go off track, off the tangent. So, so the approach is standardized uh, over the many years and refined, refunded with input from scientists, regulatory people, uh, other uh, 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 jurisdiction. So this kind of approach is very rigid uh, to to uh, to follow. Next. So to cut the long story short, so in the work groups uh, uh, during the workshop and uh, 12 months, more than 12 months before that, collecting data and and uh, writing a document. In fact, it's been done over a number of years to uh, collect the data and uh, references, over several thousands of references. And we set up criteria to select uh, uh, suitable references and appropriate references. And then the, the upon the uh, working group, uh, myself included, to agree to to read the references and do the thing. So it took a number of years, but the last 12 months was in, intensive. And the very last 11 days is more in, intensive. So come up with the conclusion that, and the summary is published in uh, November 2023, um, the monograph 135 will be pum, uh, published anytime soon. It's definitely before end of 2024. And we're hoping to see that in the next quarter or so. Uh, if that uh, not in the hands of a publisher already. Uh, so what the work group and the literature suggest and conclude that the PFO is the group one uh, carcinogen and uh, PFOS is the group 2B, is a possibly carcinogenic to human. Next. So I said the number of uh, table generate, summary table generated, the key evidence to support the conclusion or the evaluation is sufficient evidence for cancer in experimental animals. Uh, increase with increased incident uh, of appropriate combination of benign and malignant neoplasm, meaning cancer, and also GLP, good laboratory practice studies uh, in male and female. Uh, this is an, in addition to limited evidence of cancer in human for renal cancer uh, and a testicular uh, uh, cancer. 
other cancer look at too, like breast cancer and prostate cancer and another lymphoma and so on. Uh, but these two uh, are the most consistent uh, in the studies uh, reported and also supported by strong mechanistic evidence in exposed humans, uh, in addition to, to, to animals as well. So when all the evidence come together, uh, the work group, the working group was confident or uh, to the point at that time, to the current knowledge, to conclude PFO is the uh, group one carcinogen. Whereas for group two, uh, at this point, is inadequate evidence for cancer in human. It's only very limited uh, evidence in experimental animals. Uh, despite uh, there's got strong mechanistic evidence to support it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in the experimental animal, as well as the human um, um, studies, uh, is lacking uh, strong evidence to put PFOS into a group one carcinogen. Next. So some of the work I refer to um, is, is, is not only my own work, uh, it's done by uh, a number of collaborators and particularly uh, uh, Barry Nola over the years, um, uh, Professor uh, Hugh Harris in um, Adelaide and in more recent years, a uh, single tron expert, uh, my senior uh, research fellow, uh, Chang Pang, and uh, a big list of PhD students. They, they're now uh, holding a good position in, in whether government, industry, or academic arena. Um, there's been a number of partnerships. Um, I'm, I, I come from uh, uh, Quais. Uh, Queensland Alliance for Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, this uh, Center of Excellence is a partnership of Queensland Health uh, University of Queensland. Uh, we've got funding over the years, got from ARC, uh, CRC, and industry partner list below there, a number of mining company. Uh, Queensland EPA have been very supportive. Uh, the uh, guidance document and the HIL uh, working group involvement from me is um, uh, funded by NHMRC, and I have been with, involved with, with WHO and IR uh, probably for over the last 20 years. Uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you. Next slide. Yes, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Jack. Very interesting. We'll go straight to some questions. Um, where, where we feel the question's already been answered as part of Jack's presentation, we've just put that note answered in presentation in red. So thanks for the feedback from one of the audience regarding that. So first of the early bird questions, thoughts on a replacement for the current approach for PFAS bioaccumulation adopt 99% criteria, therefore food chain models? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, PFAS got a very long life, half-life uh, <clears throat> in human. Uh, that's not the, the same in animal. And we don't understand why it's such a big difference in terms of um, how the body uh, deal with uh, animal, uh, with um, uh, PFAS. Uh, in humans, it's over a number of years. Um, in animal, you can range from days to weeks. Uh, that said, PFAS stay in the body for a very long time. It, it binds with um, the protein uh, in the blood as well as in the protein uh, in our organ, particularly in the liver. Uh, it does get excreted uh, from the uh, fecal uh, feces and uh, urine, it does get excreted. But the fact that it's very, very persistent, so the 99%, uh, assuming is, is um, uh, available, I guess the question is related to that, uh, is probably uh, a little bit conser conservative, but uh, given that it's a long half-life and 
and stays in the environment and the body for many years, uh, that's not a bad uh, assumption. Uh, the food chain, uh, human gets almost, not almost, but most, uh, most of the um, exposure from food. Uh, so the food chain model is probably still valid. Uh, however, uh, if a knowledge evolve, um, we might have uh, new input uh, into uh, the model. The human health risk assessment uh, and, uh, and uh, environmental management uh, is being reviewed by US EPA at the moment. Uh, in fact, I was invited to, uh, to provide external uh, uh, review, but the timing doesn't suit me. I'll be away during the time and also a bit reluctant to to participate uh, before the release or the published uh, publication of uh, the monograph. Uh, so it's a bit too soon for me. So uh, perhaps I, I could have uh, input uh, if I was asked uh, next year, but not this year. All right. Next question. Can biochar remove PFAS and PFOS? Uh, the short answer is yes. In fact, um, and many people, uh, mainly researchers and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, industry as well, uh, developing a biochar uh, removal uh, techniques or tools, uh, particularly activated biochar and uh, with a service modification, um, it's been demonstrated it can remove uh, PFAS uh, uh, nicely. Uh, no, uh, there's no difference to either remediation strategy or removal strategy, like the uh, anionic exchange, which then has been used by the industry as well. Uh, what do you do with the waste, the concentrated waste? Uh, so you still got another step or remediation to concern about. Uh, a common uh, approach is probably through a thermal uh, degradation. There might be others, uh, but the borderline, uh, the bottom line is uh, how much does it cost? Uh, will the will um, the industry or um, or the stakeholders, including uh, the contaminated site and the industry providing the technology, uh, can afford it? Uh, that's another question. All right. The next question, how much PFAS, PFO and PFOA comes in from agriculture? Well, I, I would think fair bit. Um, as I said before, we get most of our exposure from food. So any agricultural practices involving um, fertilizer or or uh, amendment, or the soil itself already contaminated PFAS. Uh, also, uh, food uptake that eventually go to the hu for uh, human consumption, and that's the food chain. Uh, so the food pathway is, is a significant uh, pathway. Of course, the agricultural practices uh, also contributed, uh, is a key uh, pathway contribution to the food contamination. All right. Question number five. Biosecurity Act provides limits for substances in stock feed, for example, lead. How would you see the guidance? I can't see that now. Yes. Uh, Interacting with this act. Yes. Um, those act, uh, I don't think any agricultural act is uh, uh, classified PFAS, uh, off tangent a little bit, and knowing that P4 is now carcinogen. So I think I say the livestock feed will be reviewed. Lead has been around for youngs. Uh, we know uh, a bit more about lead. Um, so the guideline value around the world, uh, world from uh, Europe, USA to, to here, um, ranging from 10 ppm uh, to 
to 20 ppm. Uh, there might be some slight variation between countries. Uh, but at the moment, uh, in my personal view, uh, is compared to a contaminated site, 20 ppm is nothing. Uh, in fact, the uh, human health uh, HIL levels are higher than the, the stock fees. So we're living on a contaminated site. Uh, so you're exposed to, uh, to uh, a high concentration, not higher intake because the uh, exposure is lower. That said, I think 10 to 20 ppm of lead, uh, given that lead uh, is uh, less uh, bioavailable and also in livestock, uh, uh, tend to contain a uh, higher level of a uh, phosphate. Uh, phosphate is a, a, a wonderful uh, immobilizer of lead for uptake. So to me, uh, no doubt guideline we get reviewed from time to time, but to me, uh, the short, question, uh, short answer to the question is, the current guideline is pro probably uh, sufficient. Or maybe conservative, is that what you're saying? It, it's always conservative, uh, Richard. Uh, but it's conservative uh, to a point that is probably acceptable. Will yeah. the IARC classification change Australia's health-based guideline values for food and water? Short answer again, yes. Uh, but I can't answer when. Uh, food is a major pathway to human exposure so so I would think food together with water drinking water we get review uh, sooner or later okay I'm just going to try and get these questions to show up sorry seem to have a I'm showing up before Aha. All right, we've got nine questions in the Q and A. Are you happy to? Oh, my God, I just lost it. Uh, are you happy to keep going, Jack? Yes. If you're happy, I'm happy. I'm very happy. Thanks well, you've got much. the mouse. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks very much for everyone who's still on. Question from James Stewart from Always Carbon. Interested, are these contaminants also monitored, sampled as food in the human supply chain as well as over the years of production? Yes. Um, different jurisdiction um, uh, measuring them. Uh, the fact that got, they got uh, garland values, they need to be monitored. So yes, the research is also monitoring that too. I was wondering, you know, you mentioned about the Delaney clause and that's about food additives. Yep. And then let's say we've got a site where we're irrigating with wastewater and yep. there's various things in it. So there's some potential for accumulation of things there that aren't food additives, they're just going into food um doesn't apply it doesn't apply so is yeah, there a food additive you need to be a food additive otherwise a contaminant and right. it's got it's got a different uh legislation for it right do you feel the uh, legislation's sufficient to be protecting people they need to review it <laughs> because you know, the reason why um, uh, doing risk assessment from a long cancer endpoint to a cancer endpoint uh, is a different approach. You need to crunch the number to to test the current number where they're still valid. Yeah, so plenty of work to do there. Better yep. keep moving with the questions. This talk has got me thinking. This is Martin O'Rourke. Many commercial large-scale solar panel farms on agricultural land are starting to graze sheep under the solar panels. 
The panels provide shade and the drip line from the solar panels encourage grass growth. My question is, are there and is there, I guess, an undesirable contaminant coming off the solar panels that may affect the sheep and bioaccumulate in the sheep if they are used for human consumption? That's a, that's a good research topic. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Neither do I. We'll take that one on notice. Next question is from Ken Gilbert. Do you feel the ASC NEPM approach should be more aligned with the ocean disposal guidelines and include a clear sequential step for assessing bioavailable content via a weak acid digest or similar method to reduce the amount of false positive conclusions inherent in the current method? Well, ocean disposal, to, in my personal view, it, it shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Uh, we are talking about two different environments, aquatic environment and also could compare to a landfill, for instance, right? The, the, there's, uh, the leaching is different in the ocean. There's no, they're very, well, there's no uh, acidic condition as far as I know in the ocean. So the acidic extraction protocol is not relevant. There are plenty of people looking at the ocean health, uh, but but I'm not one of them. Uh, so, but but I would have thought management of landfill and management of ocean totally different. You, you need a different you know set of tests. You need a um, different set of tests. Right. Are you saying we don't know enough about the ocean to know whether it's safe to discharge the water to it? Well, in longer term, it's always unsafe, but let's park that way, park that one. Okay. Next question, an anonymous attendee. Do we need to consider species variation for MCI? Why use a cow and not a pig? Good question. Because it's um, pigs don't eat grass. Uh, the the contaminants are revegetated. Uh, they want to turn that into a, um, a sustainable uh, remediation. So cattle grazing uh, is is the uh, our approach, our appropriate approach. Because as I said before, mine size and cattle grazing area overlaps in Australia. You don't necessarily uh, let uh, pig out on a, uh, a mansa, but you do let uh, cattle out on a site adjacent to a mansa, and they might have, may or may not have access to a mansa. Good answer. Another anonymous attendee. There has been a large focus on PFOS and PFO within the media, and consequently an increase in the number of non-stick PFO free products available. However, should we still be concerned about the toxicity of all the other PFAS chemicals out there? Yeah, we know very little, despite thousands of publications, we know very little about uh, thousands of them. You know, five, six thousand compounds, we probably, uh, we, when I say we, not me not I personally, but we as a scientific uh, uh, community know more than a couple dozens of them. Mm -hmm. With the toxicity data, you're probably limited to less than a dozen, right? We got good handles on P, P4, uh, P4 at the moment. That's why it's this um, group one carcinogen. Uh, but uh, they are say P4, we get review over the years in years to come. So there are many other uh, compounds out there. Uh, they serve their uh, purpose, but because of the per uh, persistency of the uh, this type of compound, uh, so stay away uh, from a direct exposure is not a bad idea. Given there's so many compounds, Jack, how do you know where to start? 
Like, how do you know which ones to study next? Who tells you which ones to study next? Uh, which one in the environment higher you get the attention? So it's based on concentration. Yes. Amount, amount of yes. Stuff. Yes. All right, next question, Christy Hansen. Regarding P4 carcinogenicity, can you comment on whether cancer is likely to be the most sensitive endpoint? Therefore, will other non-cancer effects manifest at lower exposure levels than would be associated with a non-negligible excess cancer risk? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh... PSA, the future risk assessment, will be based on cancer uh, for PFO. Uh, but that's not to say you don't concern about the other can uh, uh, agents. Um, also, if I may use an example for arsenic. Uh, arsenic has always been, uh, uh, been regarded as a carcinogen for many, many years back in the 80s. And the risk assessment was done in skin cancer. Despite thousands of uh, uh, documents out there, non-cancer endpoint, uh, you know, the, the skin changes, uh, liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, um, uh, and, and other non-biological endpoint, uh, more importantly, the cardiovascular effect. So yes, those endpoints have been looked at, but at the end of the day, the cancer endpoint is still the most sensitive endpoint at that time. So you do this uh, evaluation both on the most sensitive endpoint. When I say the most sensitive endpoint, is the endpoint that at a lower dose, it still will cause the effect sooner or later. Not to everyone, mind you, but it's, it increased the risk. And back in the 2004, uh, 2011, maybe I was involved in, in another round of review of arsenic. Not only the endpoints change, the cancer, cancer endpoint change. We move from skin cancer to lung cancer because sufficient data at that time to say that lung cancer is more more sensitive, okay? So we change our risk assessment from skin to lung. They I say we might look at bladder cancer in a few years to come because a lot more uh, research coming on uh, for that endpoint. But at the end of the day, you will see uh, uh, the cancer endpoint related to those it probably the most sensitive endpoint, but you 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 also consider lung cancer endpoint. Of course you do, because that, that might let's say oxidative uh, oxidative stress or hormone regulation. Uh, up to a, a a point, you might have other uh, undesirable biologic biological outcome. Okay, uh, so. As a risk assessor or toxicologist, you always consider all the endpoints, but you, for a regula uh, regulator, they always look at, tend to look at the most sensitive endpoint and most reliable endpoint. It's sort of interesting to look at endpoints. We had the Victorian EPA Applied Sciences Group on this, and they were looking at the effects of contaminants on mental health. So. Yes. We may not get cancers, but we might all go mad. Is that sort of uh, acceptable scenario, Jack? Well, <clears throat> also stress is another wonderful thing. And that relates to mental health as well. If someone tells you you live on a contaminated site or your house is contaminated, the first thing come to you is stress. There's been many studies linked to stress to uh, mental health. So... Yeah, mental health is important, of course, yeah. All right, next question. This one's from Ken Gilbert. In relation to PFAS exposure, how do you feel we should manage exposure from contaminated land and water versus voluntary exposure from everyday 
exposure such as consumer products? You you manage this as, as you always manage contaminated site. Uh, if technology available is a concentration justified for remediation, you do that. If it's some sort of management plan can minimize exposure, uh, you do that. Uh, so it's no different to lead contamination or cadmium contamination. There's contamination uh, site, so there's a guideline. Uh, the industry people will will um, better understand the guideline than I do because you're the day-to-day -day -day practitioner. Just follow the guideline. That's all you got. Um, you know, um, Jack, I think we as a researcher, is... we always try to do something uh, new or that can uh, contribute to uh, to future revision of the guideline or, or help uh, the stakeholder. I think the emphasis on that last question was also alluding to like if you're using cosmetic products and that sort of thing that might have um, yeah. the same compounds in it. Yeah. Do they, I'm not sure, do they come under the same scrutiny? Like, I don't know, a skincare product having yeah. PFAS in it or something yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure they, they got regulatory um, um, regulation on it, but yes, uh, they raise a very good point. PFO, PFAS got a dermal uptake halfway. It's not small, so they, they do get absorbed. There seems to be more noise emerging around like pharmaceuticals and that sort of thing. Um, yep, yep. All right, better keep charging on. Uh, Dr. Nazrul Islam, you might know him. Yep. The Euglena toxicity evaluation model is applicable for other chemicals such as pesticides? Yes. Good answer. In fact, in fact, people use it for different chemicals. Okay. Jonathan Hilliard, current and previous focus in guidance and literature is on PFOS, PFOA and Wow, PFHS. Yes. Has any research you're aware of indicated other PFAS compounds may require similar focus? Well, those three are uh, has been focused a fair bit, um, but yes, other compounds been looked at. Uh, I mean, if you look at Ojo's paper, my pe previous PhD student, we looked at six compounds. And that took us three years, three and a half years to sort it out, to look at interactions. So we're only touching the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. We're not even touching the tip of the iceberg. We just have a taste of it. Do you think it's something we could automate, Jack, to speed up the process? Uh, cell line can be. chemical test, <laughs> they got auto analysis. Yeah, that's about it, you know. Uh, you still need extraction, although some extraction can be all, all automated, but yeah, chemical measurement uh, is falling behind in terms of um, volume. In US, um, Center for CDC and other big organization, they turn over tens of thousands um, results a day yeah. using cell lines. It is so-called a toxicology for the 21st century. So everyone moving into high throughput um, cell line, 15 endpoint, 10 to 15 replicates for each concentration, tens of thousands of data come through every day. Right. Um, next question, and a big thank you to David Detrick for introducing me to Jack. Uh, this webinar wouldn't have happened without David, so thanks very much, Dave. Uh, David's with Earth Systems. I've been a, a regular contributor 
to these webinars. So really appreciate that. Uh, last question, appropriately from David. Is it worth using molecular risk models for initial assessment with so many new chemicals? Repeat the question again. Is it worth using molecular risk models for initial assessment with so many new chemicals? Well, the drug company been using that for many years. I'll give you one example. I was setting up a, a GLP uh, lab in Australia many years ago. I visited three pharmaceutical company uh, in Japan that that uh, conducting GLP uh, studies. So I met the president, one of the company, and asked him, have you found any new drugs yet? Based on structural relationship and molecular modeling and, and biological testing. And he said to me, I've only been a president for 10 years. In the last 10 years, you haven't found anything new. Despite the they um, employ over 600 scientists, right? I said, how do you make your money? Oh, we just uh, produce uh, Panadol and generic drugs to make money. I said, you're a patient man. No new drugs in 10 years. Yes, yet. He said, my patient will run out in the next five years. <laughs> if we don't find anything new or worthwhile producing, then I need to get another 600 staff members. There you go. Any kind of molecular modeling to a point. But when you want to use that to predict risk, I think there we got a long way to go to go. It's better than nothing though, right? It is. If if the compound shares um same mode of action, uh, you've got a, a good chance to get there. If the compound doesn't share same mode of action, then it's difficult if, it, if it's not possible. Well, Jack, thanks very much for answering all those questions and your presentation. Thank We've you. come to the end of the webinar, and uh, I have to say that was one of the best we've ever had. Really very interesting. And um, thanks very much for your con contribution to the industry as well. It's been uh, a very long career in, in toxicology. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you for the attendance. Yeah. Thank you.